I think many people might want to have less stress and go back to some kind of everyday normality. But the type of normality, let's go back to this unjust and unsustainable way of collective living. I don't think many people would want that. Hello and welcome to Idioma de Normalität. I'm just kidding. Hello and welcome to Idioms of Normality on Future Framed TV, the collective podcast series of Traces Dreams. And today I'm joined with Robert Lepenese. Willkommen. Vielen Dank. Thanks so much for having me, Paul. Und wie geht's du? Fantastisch. <laughs> <laughs> before we get started, Robert, thank you so much for your time. And I would like to ask before we jump in with the first question, what perspectives and experiences do you bring to the question, what is normal? Thanks. I think I'm a pretty undisciplined scientist in the sense that I've been jumping from discipline to discipline, and particularly in the social sciences and humanities. So I'm really curious about the question and um, using all these different perspectives to answer it because it gets me racing. So <laughs> my my heart and my, my head is racing at the same time. I have a background in politics, philosophy, and economics, and then international political economy, which I studied in the UK. And then I came back to Berlin, where I was born and raised to do my PhD in political science, but actually didn't really do it in political science, more in philosophy of economics, looking at the philosophy of economics textbooks, how we teach economics to students. And then decided to flip this entirely, go to Italy, Florence, do a postdoctorate there, and work on nudging and philosophy of behavioral economics. And then, you know, always together uh, with my partner and my three kids. So we've been like roaming around a little bit. And now I've been working at the Hamel Center for Environmental Research in Leipzig, working on environmental governments and sustainability questions. That's a lot of interesting work, but also it's brought you to some really important work as well. So before I get distracted with this incredible <laughs> CV, what, in your opinion, is normal? I don't know. <laughs> You're the most that, honest interviewee I've had so far. <laughs> where, but, <laughs> where would we start, in your opinion, to answer this question, if we wanted to answer it? Well, there's a little bit more to that, of course. There are three things that come to mind. First, luxury. It's a luxury to be able to ask that question, what is normal? Then second, it's only going to be three things. It's luxury, hope, and power. It's luxury to think about this question. It makes me hopeful because it enables us to think about alternatives. But as a political scientist, I think about power. Who gets to define what is normal and how? who gets to influence us and in how we answer this question? So it's a bit of a meta answer. <laughs> no, it's brilliant. Let's tackle the first luxury. In what way do you think it's a luxury to be asking this question? Well, you asked me to do this interview and I was super grateful to do it, but you didn't have to move it for any reason because you were hungry or because you had a more pressing issue coming up. You, we could take the time to sit, talk over 10 thousands of kilometers of distance and reflect upon that issue. What a luxury. And wouldn't it be amazing if everyone had the psychological safety, economic, political, social safety to take out these 20, 30 minutes and think about that question mm. and think about alternatives and possibilities. How can we get to a world where this ability to have this conversation is more widespread? So that's why it's a luxury. Absolutely. I, I agree 100% on you. And I, I don't believe it's just a luxury. In another sense, I also see it as a bit of a responsibility to question it when we get to the third part of your answer, which is power. But when you said luxury, I also, my mind jumped to another way of interpreting that response. And that is the luxury of wanting a return to normal or the luxury of wanting to go back to normal, the luxury of having normal or normality in the first place. You know, the things we consider normal are actually only normal for such a small percentage of people in the world. You know, it's normal to be without illness that already puts you know a lot large percentage of the world out of the normality category it's normal to have a home well then again a large people are, are not in that category it's normal to have food on your table again mm. that takes a whole bunch of people so there was one way in which i took your answer 
about the question, what is normal being a luxury to contemplate? And two, quite for me, I think quite important ways of thinking about it, not just that it's a luxury to have normality, but it's also a luxury to question it, to think about mm. it, to problematize it. And I would add, perhaps it's really important to, and I think in order to address the fact that it's a luxury to be able to do that, mm. how can we make this contemplative time much more equitable for people around the world? Mm. The second part of your answer was hope. <laughs> Unpack that for me. <laughs> Thinking about normality and the question what is normal already implies that there's deviance from normality, right? Because can't be without it. And so when you think about that, there's always norms or normality are always connected to the possibility of things being different. Things, how our relationships, how we are relating to each other, how we treat nature, how we treat different genders, how we produce, consume and travel. All these things viewed through the lens of normality, they open up these different pathways, these different possibilities. That's why I, it gives me so much hope. It's the opposite of feeling stuck, like asking that question. So that's what makes me so hopeful. Hopeful in which direction? Hopeful in that we as humans are a species that have this reflection about what is normal built in, right? And we can always tap back into that. And that's what makes me hopeful. It, it's very hard to get people stop questioning what is normal. And that makes me hopeful for the future because that's never going away. That we can be aspirational, that we can be... Mm, that we have these reflective capabilities, thinking about the world in alternatives, not just accepting things, but thinking about, well, maybe we should treat animals differently. Maybe we should treat ecosystems differently. Asking this question already shows that there are so many possibilities. That's why it makes me hopeful. Yeah. Hopeful about the human practices that we could perhaps normalize in making a better mm. society. Well, I guess most dramatically hopeful about saving ourselves <laughs> and the world and, you know, the planet that I guess is uh, many sustainability scientists first concern. But then also, I mean, this is a societal issue, you know, uh, environmental problems are societal issues and depend on how we relate to each other. So <laughs> yeah. what is not is really the perfect question about questioning all of this. And yeah, it brings me back to having hope about how things could be otherwise. I want to add some nuance to your thoughts there, if I could interject a little bit, because I'm not sure that it is built into humans to want normality, but I certainly think it's mm -hmm. built into humans to be all the other things you said, to be reflective, to be hopeful, mm -hmm. to want to create a better world, because normality is a concept that is only 190 years old, if that. In my eyes, it's quite funny that this concept, which isn't even two centuries old, has become so pervasive and so widespread that it has infiltrated the consciousness of any person on the mm. planet who speaks a language where the word normal exists in it. And I sometimes wonder if the concept of normality could be limiting in our imagination for a world that we could hope for mm. i wonder if if we just want to achieve normality if we want a return or if we want to go mm. back to normality then we're limiting ourselves and i think we can do better than that oh of course i totally agree maybe there are two different concepts <laughs> of normality one rather let's say thin one where you say back to normal leave me alone <laughs> <laughs> and the other one kind of thinking more about different types of normality that could be achieved meaning let's live in a world where normal looks like this for you and like that for this person and like that for that person right so i think the thin concept of normality is quite harmful because whether that's COVID or climate change I guess no one really should want to go back to normal in the sense that normal was unjust, unfair, unsustainable. We were wasting our resources, depleting the planet's capacities and so forth. I think many people might want to have less stress and go back to some kind of everyday normality. But the type of normality, let's go back to this unjust and unsustainable 
way of collective living. I don't think many people would want that. Well, yeah, certainly the majority of people on the planet would probably want something <laughs> better. I mean, if, if other animals could talk, then I think they might want better from us as well. The third part of your answer, power. Mm. That was a nice little third <laughs> nugget. Yeah, it's the question of what determines why people want normality and what they understand as normality. And for me, that's the real key to power in society is do you have the power to influence people so that they change the answer to the question, what is normal? So if put different, if I own newspapers that rail against immigrants and are populist, right? I have the power to, well, to influence to a great extent or to tap into people's prejudices about what they think is normal, right? And that's true power. It's, or it's also writing economics textbook, you know? trying to share knowledge about what people think the economy is and should be like. So real power is changing how people answer the question, what is normal, right? I think that's really a, an important part of problematizing normality and challenging it and disrupting mm. it is, mm. you know, a lot of people are being sold on this product of normality and they want it. And the closer they get to it, the further away from them it goes because mm. they will never be skinny enough or they will never be voluptuous enough or they will mm. never have the perfect skin enough. And it's these qualities that are arbitrary and shifting and mobile. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's the, mm. the thin concept of normality. Then there's the normality of, of all the comforts and conveniences that we fill our life with. And those are things that we're being told we should have. It's these imperatives that we're filled with and who mm. finds what those imperatives are get to really hold sway, not just over how we spend our money, but how we live in our own heads. Mm. Are there some ways in which we can tackle power and who oh. gets to find more value? <laughs> yeah, I guess through opening up a spaces of reflection and communication. I mean, that's <laughs> one thing to be open and honest and transparent and Never stop questioning. And then I guess, depending on what political leaning you are, I guess social liberals would say, well, if you have concentrated power in society, for example, exhibited by concentration of wealth or income, then these skewed concentrations impact on what is normal and what people think is normal, right? Because things that are not normal are always more difficult to justify. Change must always justify itself. And normality never has this burden of proof of showing that it's better than the alternative, right? It's always fighting against the headwinds when you try to change things, right? So skewed concentrations of power, wealth, income, for example, make it harder to change things. The wow. few people dominate the, what, the conception of what is normal. Yeah. The burden of justifying change is on the people questioning the status quo. Yeah. And the vast majority of people who never question normality, who never question that they should just maintain doing what they're already doing, might mm. not realize the impact this is having on other humans, on the rest of the planet, on mm. their future generations. Maybe they do, but maybe we don't have spaces where we can meet as equals and discuss these things, right? And that's another aspect of unequal wealth, where... People who are rich live together. People who are rather poor live together. The segregation of society that's described by different social scientists doesn't allow for these discussions and alliances and coalitions and, you know, debates. So maybe, yeah. <laughs> Excluding people from the conversation maintains the status quo. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing I find most insidious about the way in which normality has become the structure to which we construct society is that often it's not an intentional, I don't want that person in this conversation. Mm -hmm. That person doesn't get to be part of the conversation because they can't afford the time, mm -hmm. you know, half an hour to speak on Skype with this other person on the other side of the planet because they're busy working 15-hour days in a job that pays them less than they can actually live off. Or mm. So I think we would have richer conception of what we should have instead of normality or of normality if people, for example, had things, <laughs> didn't have the 
cognitive stress or if they had financial security and all these other things that we know from, uh, you know, welfare studies and so on that, you know, enabling people to reflect about this, but more importantly, having the preconditions so that they can afford to do it yeah. cognitively, materially, socially. So it's a much deeper question than just thinking, okay, let's reflect about what would be better than normality. No, it's about changing the political, social background against w in which we argue. <laughs> wow, this is really deep. So let's go back to the simple answer and just sum that up. So what is normal is related to luxury. <laughs> it's related to our hopes. And it's also related very strongly to power. Hmm. What questions do you think we should ask about luxuries, hopes, and power? I think two questions. First, who is included and excluded when we ask that question? What is normal? Who do we generally not ask? Is it specific types of people who have specific characteristics? Is it future generations or animals or non-sentient bees or whatever? <laughs> And the second question is, and I'm glad we talked about it, is who has the power to influence these answers? And how can we find out? That's what I would say. Robert Lefanese, Danke schön. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you and asking you the question, was ist normal? <laughs> <laughs> Vielen Dank. Liebe Grüße. Thanks a lot, okay. Paul. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. And if you have any suggestions about who we should perhaps interview in the next episode of Idioms of Normality, please drop us a line. Or if you have any other thoughts, we always love to hear from you. This is Paul Mason coming to you from Idioms of Normality on Future Frame TV, the collective podcast of Traces Dreams. <laughs>